as you probably realize, two the last two Sundays, Allie and I haven't been here. And you realize that because I wasn't standing up here for two weeks. And I just want to thank Roy for filling in and, and for blessing you guys with the word of God while we were gone. And um, we, two weeks ago, we left Thursday night right after work, drove up to Sacramento. And then from Sacramento, we went to Portland, from Portland to Seattle, Seattle back to Portland. And then we went Portland to Santa Clarita in one night, which resulted in a good old 2 a.m. arrival time back to our house which the next weekend we were supposed to drive to Boise, Idaho for one of my best friend's weddings. And I was like, there is no way that we're doing a 16 hour drive across the middle of nowhere. So that next morning I woke up, quickly booked some Southwest flights. And see, being in the real estate business, I'm constantly writing loans for people who are moving to Boise. I, I don't get it. I was in Boise, Idaho. They're telling it's 102 degrees at 7 p.m. And they're like, oh yeah, this is the hottest time of day. I said, it's 7 p.m. It's, you're supposed to be cooling down on your patio and people, and yet everyone is just flocking to Boise. I, I don't understand it. So if you come to me and you're like, hey, John, can you pray for us? We're going to Boise. No, you should not go to Boise. <laughs> you should, if you guys want to plant Gateway Bible Church, Vancouver, Washington though, you have the blessing. It's right there by a river. Like you could be out there worshiping God with the river flowing behind you. Um, but many of you guys like me heard the bad news last week. I was, I was getting ready to go to my best friend's wedding and I found out that I did not win the $1.28 billion lottery jackpot. I know I had all these plans and I know what you're thinking. Oh, what were your numbers? So here's the first, I didn't buy a ticket. So that's the first problem. But I was really disappointed that I did not win. I was like, man, imagine the building we could get Gateway Bible Church. We could buy out Higher Vision maybe and use that. It's like, then we could have a house, but I didn't win it. And the funny thing is, is I never even bought a lottery ticket, yet somehow finding out that I didn't win it, I was bummed out. Did I, am I alone or does anyone else know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm alone. Okay, thank you, Marcus. <laughs> I was just driving and, I, and even Allie, she's like, what is it with you in the lottery? And I was like, I just, it's fun to dream, you know? It's fun to think about the private jet landing at Van Nuys Airport with Gateway Bible down the side. When I told this story at work this week, it was Augusta Financial down the side, but it's, it's fun to dream. Uh, and knowing that that dream can never be a reality now because it's been won and gone, it's like, all right. But I joke, I joke about the lottery. However, I know there's many people in this room that are actually going through trying times. It's often said that as followers of Christ, we're in three stages of life. We're either going into a trial, we're in a trial, or we're coming out of a trial. And if you're coming out of a trial, you can probably predict your next stage of life, which is you're probably going to be going into a trial. But if you're in a trial, good news, you're going to be coming out of a trial soon. And, and as many of you may find yourself in that situation this morning, we, we just came out of a pandemic where we were locked inside, where we lost jobs. I know I was laid off from my job during the time. We couldn't see family members. Many of us lost family members during the pandemic and we couldn't be there in the hospital to see them. This week, our governor just declared another state of emergency for the state of California for some other disease. And then on top of that, we hear about inflation, the recession that's coming. We hear about all the crime that is just escalating and escalating and escalating. And it's probably crossed your mind, where is the joy? Where is the hope in the situation? I was talking with Ali on the drive here that, that when we were dating, we always get asked, when are you gonna get married? Now we're married and we get asked, when are you gonna have children? And, and honestly, the thought, when I, when I read the headlines, I'm like, what, do I wanna raise a kid in this? Like, where, what's gonna be the world that my children grow up in? I'm, I'm only 28 and I don't even like the world I'm still growing up in right now. And it just is, it, where's the hope? Where's the joy? I, I ended my last message with you guys a few weeks ago with this, but we're going to plant this morning in Psalm chapter 23. 
So if you would turn to Psalm 23 with me. And as you turn there, this, this is often considered one of the most popular passages of Scripture. You've probably been over to a friend or family member's house who doesn't go to church, doesn't believe in God, and yet in some room of their house, they probably have something with Psalm 23 on it. I would say the only other passage of Scripture that even rivals Psalm 23 is John 3.16. And, and the problem with these verses that just get mass marketed is they get twisted and twisted and twisted and they put, get put in Instagram bios, tattooed on people's arms. But this morning I want to go verse by verse through Psalm 23. And I hope that this answers the question, where is the joy? Where is the hope? Psalm 23 verse 1, it's, it's a psalm written by David. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, this is your church, this is your service, and this is your word that we get to study this morning. Father, I pray that I'll just merely be a vessel that you speak through after having spoken to me all week, God, and, and studying your word. And I just pray that as we leave this building this morning, Father, that we'll have hope and that our hope will be rightly placed in you, Jesus. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. So Psalm 23 here describes a shepherd and his sheep. And I don't know about you, but as you think of animals, there are some animals that are known for being cunning and wise and smart. And then some animals that are known for being dumb. Sheep fall into the dumb category. You know, if you don't believe me, watch this video. Play it one more time, Mark. It's just for the full effect. So this sheep is, is in a ditch. He gets rescued. And the first thing he's going to do is jump right back into the ditch. And, and so as we watch that video and now turn our attention to Psalm 23, we understand why there's so much emphasis placed on a shepherd. Psalm 23 is often read at funerals. It's often read when someone's sick and, and really somber times, you know, you're at a bedside and you're like, hey, the Lord is my shepherd. It's read in like a monotone voice. There's even a, a hymn written about it. And it's like, the Lord, it's kind of like ancient lamentation style. But when you know Psalm 23, David wrote this when he was towards the end of his life. And it's thought of that he was writing this during 2 Samuel, somewhere between chapters 13 and 19 during Absalom's rebellion. And in the first three verses, he's going to talk about God's adequacy. He then goes on to talk about God's serenity, God's certainty, and then our eternity, which is secured in Christ. And so as I was praying through this and, and breaking it down, I want us to look at just two things from the text this morning. And the first point, which ended up taking 11 pages of my notes, is our good shepherd. But then the second point that we're going to end with is the good sheep. Uh, for my note takers in this room, my message is entitled, What Goes Down Will Come Up. And you're like, that's not right, John. That's backwards. I know I have dyslexia, but that is it. What goes down will come up. And because in the kingdom of Jesus, we know that it's considered the upside down kingdom, that the first are last, the last are first, the humble are exalted and the exalted are humbled. And so I'll get to what this means, but what goes down will come up. And so our first point is our good shepherd. In Psalm 23, verse 1, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd. That word, the Lord, there stands for Jehovah God. It's referring to the covenant-making God of Israel. 
The God who makes his promises and keeps his promises. The God who says what he's going to do and does what he says. That God, Jehovah God, is my shepherd. David's writing in the first person here, Jehovah God is my shepherd. And what does that mean? What does that mean for David? He quickly follows up with, I shall not want. This God who's unwavering, never changing, who's always good, always just, always loving, that God is David's shepherd. And Gateway Bible Church, that God is our shepherd. We shall not want. What does that mean? I want you guys to think about when you think about sheep nowadays, if you're like me, you think about that lamb chop that's in my refrigerator that I'm going to marinate in rosemary and eat with some mint gel. Sorry, sorry. That's tomorrow. That's dinner. When we think of sheep, though, we think of like an expensive rack of lamb at a steakhouse. We think of meat. Back in this time when David was writing this, sheep were raised and kept alive. They were not eaten. They were used for their wool. They were used for their milk. They were a first century lawnmower. They were designed to be bred and to be raised and to be herded. And then at the end of their lives, then they could be considered for, for food. But the shepherd was a really important job. It wasn't like when we drive to Ventura for a family beach day, we see a few sheep off the side of the road and go, oh look, sheep. Like to be a shepherd was a big deal. There was a lot of pride, a lot of reputation that came with it because a shepherd had to lead the sheep. He had to provide for the sheep. He had to take care of them when they were sick, when they were injured. Whatever the sheep needed, that was where the shepherd came in. Because if the he was responsible for supplying the community with wool, with milk. And, and I'm saying all this up front to really paint a picture of the importance of the shepherd and the helplessness of the sheep. A shepherd, the sheep had no needs when the shepherd was around. They were taken to the place where they were going to rest. They were taken to the field where they were going to graze. And I, I learned this and it was so cool. Sheep are not only dumb animals, but they're extremely scared animals. So like if you brought them to even the lazy river at Hurricane Harbor, they would not drink from that because it's moving too quickly. So what I learned is that shepherds would have to go upstream and dam up the river to create a, a, a tranquil pool for the sheep to come and drink from. And so there was a lot of things, but the shepherd did whatever it took so that the sheep had no needs. And so here David is saying, Jehovah God is my shepherd. I shall not want. If, if an earthly shepherd takes care of his sheep like that, how much more is Jehovah God going to take care of us? He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. God gives us rest, comfort. He doesn't make us lie down on the side of a cliff where we're dangling by a rope. No, he, it's this idea of a big green open pasture where God provides that for us. He brings us to it and says, lay down, rest, be comforted. He leads me beside still waters, the water that we can go and drink from and be nourished and restored. That, that is what God provides us. And here's, here's often what I've found in my own life, and maybe you ring true, is the Lord provides our needs. We shall not want. There's no wanting because we always have provision. Think about it. You guys woke up in a house this morning. Most of you had access to running water at some sort. Even if it was by the time you got to church, you could go wash your hands, freshen up your face. You, most of you had a bike or a car or some sort of ride, even the city bus to get here on this morning. And now you sit listening to me in comfortable chairs in an air conditioned room with lights. These are more than what we need. And yet we have access to all these things. And so oftentimes we get discouraged because it's like, well, God, I wanted to win the lottery. I wanted a private jet. Th those are wants. God has provided for us everything that we need. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 26 through 34, it says this, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jehovah God is our shepherd. We shall not want. Green pastures were given rest. Not only does the pasture provide a nice, comfortable place to, to sleep, but it's also food. That nice green grass is food. It's near still waters that the shepherd has prepared. He's dammed up the river so that it's a nice place where we can safely and securely go and drink. There's no need for anxiety when Jehovah God is leading us. Look at verse 3 with me. David writes, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You're like, okay, John, we've, we've heard this verse for our entire life. What are you trying to tell me? Well, I learned this week another thing. I'm, if you have any sheep questions, I'm your guy. Uh, there's in the, in the wild, wild west, they do these things called cattle drives where a bunch of ranchers get, get on horses, put their hat on, put some wheat in their teeth and they have dogs that go. And it's like this loud, scary, rambunctious thing where they go and drive herds of cattle to a place. And it's aggressive, ah, whips and lassos and dogs barking and tons of ranchers going and pushing cattle. They're driving cattle into wherever they need them to go. Don't ask me about cattle, just sheep. I don't know what you do when you drive them. But sheep cannot be driven. If you were to get on your horses and go try to drive a herd of sheep, they'd probably pass out because of fear. Sheep need to be led. They need someone to go in front of them who they feel safe with, who's earned their trust, and then they will follow that shepherd, that leader. Verse 3 here says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. For His name's sake. Again, like I said, being a shepherd back in the day was a big deal. Shepherds cared about their reputation. Nowadays, if I came and I was like, hey, Dave, did you hear about the shepherd in Fillmore? You'd be like, there's a shepherd in Fillmore? But back then, it's like the Fillmore shepherd lost two sheep. Oh my gosh, I was always skeptical about him. He never led the sheep. Like, it was a really big deal to take care of your sheep. God leads us in paths of righteousness. He's a good shepherd who we can trust. And he's never going to tell us, hey, See how close to the edge you can get. See how close to sin you can get. No, he's going to lead us down a nice, smooth path that leads to righteousness. And why? For his name's sake. Brothers and sisters, when we're walking with God, when we're daily communing with him in his word, on our knees, praying and seeking his face, and then taking that and letting it inform our lives, he gets the glory from that. For his name's sake, when we're walking on the straight and narrow, he gets that glory. I've said this so many times, and I'll probably just, fair warning, I'll probably say it till the end of my time with you guys, whenever God decides that is. We fight a real enemy. And so the one thing that our enemy hates is when we're walking that straight and narrow, when our lives are giving glory to God for his name's sake. And so that's why if you look at verse four, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you read through Psalm 22, the chapter before, he talks about all these wise animals that try to seek to devour wolves and dogs. And I think in, he opens it up by talking about... I lost it. I, should, I knew I should have put it in my notes. Bulls. He says, many bulls encompass me. The dogs encircle me. All these avenging animals that are trying to devour. Yet the shepherd carries a rod for that. When a, when a wolf is coming and trying to bite the legs of the sheep, the shepherd comes in with his Louisville slugger. Get away, get away. Hi God gets, scares them off. And unfortunately, us as sheep, we veer off the path sometimes. But the Lord has his staff, which, as I said last time, it's a big stick with a U. He used that to pull us back into the fold. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. And so, friends, we serve a real enemy. And when we're walking on the paths of righteousness, he wants to do everything and anything he can to get us off that. Because the minute we get off that path and we start sinning, now we're giving him the glory. Now we're keeping our, taking our eyes off of our good shepherd, off of our leader, and putting them on the enemy. Turn over with me to John chapter 10. Let's get a little New Testament action this morning. John chapter 10. And, and here is where Jesus is going to re refer to himself as the shepherd. Starting in verse 11, it's Jesus speaking here. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down for the sheep. That is our shepherd. That is where our comfort comes from. God is our good shepherd and, and he leads us on these paths of righteousness. But another aspect of sheep is that the, the sheep that are safest are the sheep that are closest to the shepherd. Because the shepherd carries his rod to defend. But if you're, if you're kind of falling off the back here, the shepherd now has to run all the way around the flock to get to you. The wolf might get a quick bite in. The shepherd's going to protect you and save you. But the, the safest sheep are the ones that are closest to the shepherd. And so, so Gateway, we need to stay close to our shepherd. And that is the safest spot. Just right before Jesus said that in verse 11, he says, The thief comes only to still, steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We are the sheep. We, we are referred to as a dumb animal. And when you think about your life, when you think about the fact that you know the gospel, that you know that you have everything you need in Christ, and yet we still choose to sin. It's like, okay, now I kind of understand why we're referred to as sheep. And when you think about how God has given everything and provided everything we need and daily leads us and is there for us, it's easy to know why he's referred to as a shepherd and the good shepherd. He provides for us. He leads us. He protects us. The, the final thing we see here in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. In, in back in David's time, a table could mean, yes, this table here with lots of food on it. And God prepares that. He prepares the blessings. But a shepherding term for a table meant a flat, smooth area of land. And so think about this. Think about you and your sheep walking through the valley. There's been wolves. Oh man, we almost got bit by a bear today. But the shepherd goes out and he prepares this safe, flat area and he brings all the sheep in there. There's food, there's drink, there's everything. There's comfort and rest. The shepherd has prepared this for a sheep. What he's going to do at the end of the day is he's going to take his staff, bring each and every single sheep individually and he would check them head to toe, 
for any cuts, any sores, any wounds. And if he found that, if there was, you know, maybe they had a splinter, they would take that out. Maybe there was a cut, he'd clean it. And then in his pouch, he carried a soothing oil that he would pour on the sheep and rub over all their wounds, which would take the pain away from the sheep. God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. Our cup overflows. That's that idea of we have far more than we could ever need. Our cup is overflowing. He blesses us. So Gateway, as, as we think about this, I know it's a passage that we've heard our entire lives, and so I could read it over and over, but most of you probably have it memorized. We as believers are never promised an easy life. I, I feel like a lot of times I see, especially in youth ministry, kids get saved and think it's a golden ticket to like, I'm going to make varsity. I'm going to be the starting quarterback. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that, that. And then it's like, oh, I got dropped from the football team. Well, why? Well, because I didn't practice. What? You didn't practice? Or I know that me, being an adult, I thought life was going to be so easy. I thought I'm going to get move out of the house, never need mom and dad ever again. And quite frankly, as I was moving and driving away from my parents' house back in 2014, <laughs> my car broke down and I called my dad and asked how to fix it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm done. I'm leaving. Hey dad, uh, this happened. Life is hard. We are never promised an easy life. And that's why I had Sean read that this morning. James chapter one, verse two says, count it all joy, my brothers, when, not if, when you meet trials of various kinds. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, six or seven, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about trials in your life and how you approach them. And then think about the way that the Bible, those, two ver those three verses right there, said how we should approach them. Count it all joy. In this you rejoice. Why would we ever do that, John? Well, I want you to think about the bodybuilder that goes to the gym all the time and is just throwing around massive amounts of weight. If you, you know, you've been there at 5 a.m. at LA Fitness where you're just running and next thing you know, you hear, ah, and it's, whoa, what's going on? It's just some like beefcake in the back trying to do his personal record. They're screaming because it's hard. They're screaming because there's pain. And when you think about how a muscle works, the stronger you get is the more you rip and tear your muscle. I know you look at me, you're like, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to lifting. But that's how the muscle works. When you lift that weight, you're tearing it apart. It's, it's being pulled and shredded. And then you take protein or Dave has different nutritional views on working out. But if you're me, you just scoop some whey protein and as your body recovers, it recovers with more tissue now and your muscles get bigger and stronger. And so you need more weight to rip them apart. Trials are the gym of Christianity. We count it all joy when we face trials of various kinds because we know that the testing of our faith produces endurance. We rejoice, Peter says, though now for just a little while. Well, John, I've been facing trials for 20 years. Well, guess what? You're going to leave eternity in heaven with not a single trial. So this is just a little while. We rejoice because trials make us more like Jesus. It, it says in Hebrews that we have a high priest who is tempted in every single way yet without sin. So he knows what we're going through. He's experienced it. And so when you go through a trial, it, it tests your faith. It rips it apart. And when you come out the other side of, of persevering through a trial, you're now stronger. So now when you come against that again, you know how to face it. Or when someone else you know comes against it, you can encourage them. God uses trials to grow us. And I, one of my disciples told me that the only way gold one of the most precious, expensive metals we have in the world, the only way gold 
gains value and gains purity is by going in a hot fire over and over and over again. The only way we grow and become more pure as believers is by going through these trials, getting into the fire, growing, because trials drive us to our knees. <laughs> I told you point number one was long. We sit here in these comfortable chairs. We could easily reach into the pulpit at any time and pull out a cold Starbucks beverage. We have so many blessings, Gateway. We have far more than we can ever need. And, and life is hard. I've, I've experienced a lot of hardships in my short life so far, and, and I know it's hard. We're never promised an easy life, but what we are promised is a good shepherd, a good leader who will always provide for us, who will always lead us. And even when we veered off the path a little bit, we got bit by a wolf because we decided to try our own thing. We got a splinter. At the end of every day, he's going to pull us back into the fold and soothe our wounds and make sure we're taken care of. The second point I want to look at this morning is the good sheep. Uh, I remember when I was living in Las Vegas, I was teaching drumline at a Christian school. The thing is, is before I started this, there was no band program at all. I went to the superintendent and convinced him to allow me, just, hey, I said, hey, just give me a shot. I think we can do this. So he did. I started a drumline program, and I remember that first year, I had 15 students come in who had never touched any musical instrument in their life. And I started off by teaching them how to read music, how to understand rhythm. And then we learned how to hold a drumstick, how to play the drums. And by the end of the school year, they were performing in front of stadiums, at basketball games, at football games, and they were doing performances. Over time, the program grew and I, I started to get kids that just needed a class, so they signed up for Drumline and they didn't want to be there. Everything I told them to do, they didn't do and it became hard. I couldn't have a group perform when there was kids that didn't want to be there. And so I'd say, hey, you need to go to the principal's office and get out of my class or else I'll do it for you. It was those kids that first year that wanted to be there. They're like, Mr. Augusta, we want this program to be cool. I was able to teach them. Everything I said, they listened to, they applied, and they performed, literally. That's what God needs. That's what God requires. And so it's going to be up here on the screen. Psalm Chapter 51, verses 16 through 17. This is David again reflecting. He says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So when David's writing this, it's, it's towards the end of his life. He for sure has done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sacrifices for himself, for the people. And so he's saying here to God, he's speaking to God, you will not delight in sacrifices or else I would give it. And then he says a broken and contrite heart. This, the word contrite is this idea of a remorseful, repentant guilt over sin. The sacrifice that God wants is that our hearts are so broken over our sin that we're repentant, that we feel so guilty for sinning against God that it drives us to our knees in repentance. He says, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. If you Google the opposite of despise, it's love. So a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Therefore, a broken and contrite heart God loves. And so Gateway We've looked at our good shepherd. We've looked at the fact that we're going to face so many trials in life. And if, if you're here sitting in this room and it just seems like life is trial after trial after trial and you're thinking, God, where are you? Hello, God. Remind, let me remind you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is unwavering, unshakable. And so if you're wondering, God, where are you? Chances are you're probably off the path in the thicket getting thorns and, and whatever it is, or there's a, there's a wolf that you've started following instead of the shepherd. A broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. 
John MacArthur says, The sorrow of true repentance is sorrow for offenses against a holy God, not simply regretting because there was personal consequences for our sin, it's, or, or sorrow because someone found out your sin, or hardship because of your sin. That's not godly sorrow, and it has nothing to do with repentance. That sort of, that sort of sorrow is, is merely selfish regret, concern for yourself and your own reputation. And that sorrow adds to the original sin. He goes on to say, when a sinner is truly repentant and comes to God in a broken and contrite spirit and asks for forgiveness, and God forgives and transforms, that is the working of the Holy Spirit. So why, why am I bringing this up? Why do I go from God is so good and so loving to you need to be better? I, I didn't say that, but you get the idea. It's, and I, I just feel it. Like I said, as Christians, we expect to get saved and just have this candy land life. But the fact of the matter is, is that God requires effort. This is for Dave, but I think about surfing. You can get the most expensive surfboard, the most expensive wetsuit, and go out into the ocean and then just sit there bobbing up and down with every wave that comes over you, and then come back in and say, I didn't catch a single wave. I had the board. I had the wetsuit. Why, God? Why, ocean? Why didn't I catch a wave? And you, did you paddle for a wave? Did you have the proper body position on the board? God, God is the ocean. The waves are coming. The power is there. But we need to rely on God's power, and we need to put in effort. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit empowers us like we look through an ax. We need to get out into the ocean, and we need to paddle and God will carry us to shore. And so I feel like so often we get into these trials that we've put ourselves in because we didn't believe God or we, we turned our back and went against scripture. And then we go, why God, where are you? Like, hello, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me like, he's never left us. We have turned aside from him. And the good thing is that shepherd stands at the gate with his staff to welcome us in even if we brought those wounds upon ourselves, he's going to soothe them. He's going to heal them because that is the God we serve, Gateway Bible Church. Finally, verse 6 of chapter 23, David writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That doesn't mean if you show up to church and tithe your 10%, you're going to get blessed and win the lottery. David here is, I get this idea, he's like kind of sitting in his room, looking out over a window, writing these things. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That, that can be translated, has followed me. He's thinking about from the time he was a kid to when he killed Goliath, to when he was king, to even after he sinned with Bathsheba, God has blessed him and loved him and forgiven him and provided him. And so he's thinking, man, I have sinned and God has forgiven me. I've sinned and God has forgiven me and he's blessed me. Goodness and mercy has followed me. And then he's looking forward and I shall dwell in God's house for eternity. So as, as I land the plane here this morning, if you're in a, in a trial right now, drop to your knees in prayer. What goes down will come up. And what God wants from us is a desperate people, desperate for his word, desperate to receive his grace. And it says, if we get to that point, a broken and contrite heart, he loves it. He will not despise it. So if you're going into a trial right now, be in the word. We don't know when the next trial is gonna hit, but we know how to get through it and it's in the word. So that's why we need to be daily seeking scripture. We need to be daily seeking to follow our shepherd down the paths of righteousness. And if you're in a trial, if you're in the weeds off to the side or a wolf's got your heel, the shepherd's coming with his rod, but you need to keep your eyes fixed on him. And if you're coming out of a trial, surely goodness and mercy has followed you all the days of your life. Remember all of God's blessings and look forward to our guaranteed promise that we have in eternity.